All right, if you have your Bibles with you, go with me to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. I'm going to read verse 20. And I think I'm going to read through verse 23. It says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who substitute darkness for light and light for darkness, who substitute bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. And woe to those who are heroes in drinking wine. I kind of laugh when I read that. <laughs> heroes in drinking wine. And valiant men in mixing strong drink. Who justify the wicked for a bribe. And take away the rights of the one, ones who are in the right. Now, the sort of thing that we see mentioned here in this verse, all these things, they come with their own particular judgments by virtue of their very nature. They do. That's what the word woe means. It's judgment upon those who do these specific things. They, they come with their own sets of judgment all by themselves. God doesn't even have to get involved in it. You understand? There's just judgments that are associated with all this stuff that, that come all by itself. And so the toxicity and the stench of these kinds of actions literally take the breath and the life away from humanity. And, and as I look out right now uh, uh, at our nation, I observe this country, naturally speaking, as I look out here, it seems that this country is hanging by a thread right now. I think we've all discovered in the midst of this craziness that there's a fine line between Sanity and servility and mayhem and anarchy. Very thin line. Sadly, today looks more like, America looks more like uh, Gotham City than it does that, you know, that city set upon a hill. The patients, it seems, are running the asylum. And so craziness and lawlessness and therefore confusion fills our streets and fills the hearts and minds of people all over our nation. And confusion is something that, how many knows, isn't sent by God. God is not the author of confusion. We know Satan is. At the same time, the leadership of a lot of the major cities are feckless and they're spineless and they're irresponsible people with no real moral courage or convictions. No real integrity, it seems. They... Wake up in the morning and just kind of see which way the wind blows, and that's the direction they end off going. Many of them are allowing people to destroy and to deface national monuments and burn down our cities and letting people seize large areas of our cities and make them autonomous cop-free zones. They think that that's okay. I guess they call one place in Seattle Chaz, right? That's its own little nation within a nation. And they've boarded it off and they've ran the police out and they say this is ours and this is the way we're going to do life now and that's just it. It's a six, can you, I never thought I'd see that in America where people just take over a portion of the city and say this is ours and cops get out of here and we're going to do as we please. It's totally nuts. It's insane. It's like, like Mad Max out there right now or Escape from New York movies that we've seen on television. I mean, talk about a generation of young people who are looking for a cause. Right now, many of them are out there running around like barbarians without wisdom, without understanding, without good sense. And most of them, you can see when you, when you hear them talk, they're, they're very ill-informed Ill and they have little need for the truth or facts or for any particular knowledge other than what they think they know. And much of what we see today is, in my view and in my opinion, is caused by the indoctrination of our kids by our modern colleges and universities who have a real agenda. It's an agenda that, um, how many knows that Satan himself is fueling? No ifs, ands, or buts about that. 
You know, it's unfortunate that many parents for many, many years, for, for a generation or more, have outsourced their responsibility to teach their children honor and respect and the importance of absolute truth, not subjective truth, not just truth for me, but there is an absolute truth for all of us. Amen? We've subjugated, you know, our, our responsibility to the television and now to social media and to our godless school systems that we have in place today. And so many of our young people, they have no real spiritual foundation to, to rely upon. So they're easily manipulated by their emotions and hearsay and, of course, just blatant lies out there. They're like sheep that's being led, led about by their own ignorance and rage. And as a result of that, there's such unrest out there. There's such anxiety and tremendous pressure is building all over our nation. And you can see that. The Apostle Paul told us that this was going to happen. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, But know this, that in the last days, perilous times, they're coming. The word perilous is the word halapos, and it means harsh, fierce, Savage times. It's the idea of, of, of times being so difficult that it literally saps the strength out of a man. The, 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 the load is so hard to bear that it feels like that we're all carrying something to the point of total exhaustion. And you say, well, what in the world would be the cause for that? Well, he, he tells us the cause. He says, for men will be lovers of them, their, them own self. Their, I'm sorry. For men will be lovers of themselves. You know, ever since the selfie and social media, people can't get enough of themselves. <laughs> Isn't that true? They'll be lovers of money, usually envious of others who have money. Boasters, you know, if I can just blow up on YouTube or social media, that'll make my life, right? Proud. Pride's always been an issue. And blasphemers and disobedient to parents, this rebellious spirit that's going around. Unthankful, that is the signature of this generation. Unthankful. Unholy and unloving. The Bible says they'll be without natural affection. Well, you can see that everywhere, right? Unforgiving, holding on to grievances. Without self-control, they have no shut-off valve. They don't know when enough's enough. Brutal, savages, fierce, despisers of good. They're opposed to good people, opposed to good men. Despisers of good, traitors. People who will turn against people, right? Thank you. Headstrong, can't be told anything, unteachable, unreasonable, stubborn, haughty. They're inflated with self-conceit. It, it's so funny. It, it's so funny how this generation asks very little questions. And the reason being is they think they know it all. Lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. Just thrill me, baby. What did Jesus say through Paul? From such people, get away from them. That ain't us. It's not to be us. This passage sounds like, like I'm reading the front page news today. It's crazy. It's crazy. We can only all plainly see the, the results of this fleshly disease that's going on out there. And listen, this is what happens when you and I kick God out of our nation. This is what takes place. And when we despise His leadership and His wisdom, and when we despise God's authority over our lives, we can't enjoy a peaceful life without the author of peace being a part of our lives. Amen? Do we all understand what I'm saying today? Amen, I hope so. 
Now, that's enough about the problem because I think we've had a good dose of all the problem. I mean, I think we've had enough. We, we, we've seen over and over and over and over and over and over the problem. So I want to talk now about some solutions because we as the church have got to endeavor to change this environment. And I believe this is where we need to begin. I believe it first begins with us as individuals. I do. Now, I want to read a couple of very familiar passages of Scripture that we all know that we've all heard a gazillion times, but they're very important. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 21, it says, Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from Him. So hold on. There's something very important there. We just found out the source of truth. Did you see that? You could have missed it very easily if we would just read right over it. He says that we have learned the truth that comes from him. The truth comes from Jesus, right? Then he says, throw off or discard your old sinful nature and your former way of life, your past, your former identity, and all the things that you associated with, which is corrupted by lust and deception. So all these former things that were a part of your life before you came to Jesus were corrupted. You may not have recognized it, understood it, realized it, but they have been corrupted. And and, and in so many ways, you lived as someone who is deceived. You lived a lie. They think, well, I lived a pretty good life. You know, I wasn't that bad. You know, we always look at stuff like that. But folks, check it out. You were dead in sin. Now you're alive in Christ. Amen. Amen. So your former life and your former identity was built upon lies and upon your own lust. God says, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Let Him renew the way you think. He says, let the Spirit show you who you really are because it will change the way that you really see things. And change isn't change until it's change, right? And so we need to adopt a brand new perspective of life. Not only how we see our own life, but how we see life in general. We need to develop a godly worldview, one that is fashioned by truth, that is based upon the gospel of Jesus Christ and who we are, all of us are, as the children of Almighty God. Now, another verse that I want to read is in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We read this verse often, but we need to hear it. It says, for though we walk, though we live in the flesh, in this flesh and blood body, in this fleshly world, we are not waging war against the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy these strongholds. See, this is what happens when you introduce truth into something. It breaks down the lie. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, these passages here are very simple, and we've said this a million times here in this house. It's all about the war that takes place for the hearts and minds of the people of God. There is a war raging. There is a war going on in our minds, and it's all about how we think. That's what this whole thing, this whole spiritual warfare thing is all about, is how we think. Because how we think controls everything we do. It controls everything. And so this is all about your perception and how you view life and how you think about others. Listen, even though we're saved, Satan wants to influence how we think. He does. He wants to shape the way you and I think, how we perceive, how we interpret life and how we interpret others. The enemy spends all this time trying to corrupt our thinking most often it happens through the news media (laughs) go ahead and say amen Amen. 
Now, we've often said that the battlefield is, is in our minds, and that's so true. And that's why the changing of people's hearts and minds is the mission of the church. It is. However, if we're going to help change the hearts and minds for the better, the church has to stop echoing the message of the world. I mean, that seems fundamental, but so many people are having a hard time with that because all I hear from in the pulpit of pastors all over this country is the talking points of the world. That's what I'm hearing. And it troubles me big time. You and I, we are, we are here to bring the good news. we got to show everyone where the escape hatch is on this sinking ship so more and more people can be rescued. And as I said in my humble opinion last week, for too long the church has lended its voice and has lended its influence to causes that over time have just ended up dividing people, pitting one people group against another people group. So we need to be mindful of our voice. We need to be mindful of where we lend our influence because the movements of this world may on the surface appear righteous and good, but beneath the veneer of it all is the same old corruptible lusts of men and it's filled full of lies because it's the world and its system. It's of the flesh. Go ahead and say amen. Amen. So then why would you and I travel this road again when we know where this road leads? We as the church have the truth. Somebody say amen to that. And how many knows the truth is the only thing that will get us down the right path that we need to go in life? It's the only thing that will produce true fruit and bring tremendous blessing upon us and upon our family and upon our nation. Amen. We have the gospel that freely reveals and describes and shows to every man what they clearly want, what they clearly desire, what they need more than anything in life. The gospel reveals it. We have Jesus who carries us. We have Jesus who empowers us. We have Jesus who loves us. We have Jesus who strengthens us. We have Jesus that will do all things through us. We have him. Amen. We have the Holy Spirit who leads and guides and comforts. Everything we need is wrapped up, tied up, and tangled all up in Jesus Christ. Look at what Jesus said. He told us this. Jesus said in Luke 4 when they handed him the scroll, remember? And he begins to read the book of Isaiah. And this is what he says about himself. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me To preach the gospel to the poor. So what's the answer to the poor? Jesus Christ is the answer to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. What's the answer for the brokenhearted? It is Jesus Christ. To proclaim liberty to the captive. What's the answer for the captives? Those who are held in prison. Those who are in bondage. Jesus Christ. And recovery of sight to the blind. What's the answer to those who have been blinded? To set it at liberty those who are oppressed. What is the answer to the oppression that is in this world right now? Regardless of where it comes from? It is Jesus Christ. Jesus told us in his own mouth, I am the answer. For everything that you're looking for in life, I am the answer. Everything you need, come to me. I am the refuge. That's why we go under the shadow of the Almighty. That's why we hide in the cleft of the rock. Because he's the one. He liberates the oppressed. Jesus, the anointed one, was sent for that very purpose. So we need to listen to him, right? We need to follow him. Amen. So then Paul says, remember in Corinthians that we just read, that we're in a major fight, but this fight is not a flesh and blood fight. It's a spiritual battle. So our fight isn't with people around us. Our our fight is this, this spiritual thing that's going on that can't be fought by natural means. And this the battlefield is right here in our mind. I want you to remember something. 
When, when Jesus died upon the cross, Satan was defeated. He was totally demoralized. He was totally stripped, bare, and naked. He had nothing left. He was defeated completely forever. Forever. Okay? So, the only ability that he has left is the ability to lie. That's what he does. He's a liar. Jesus said he's the father of it. He's the inventor of lies. Right? And so he relentlessly uses this power of persuasion and lies to influence and to shape our thinking so that we will exercise his will in the earth with our power. With the authority God has given us. So basically what I'm saying is, is that Satan needs an avatar. He does. He needs man's mind and he needs man's body to work through to get anything that he wants done in this earth done. Because without a man's authority and abilities in the earth, he has no tools. And without the tools, he has no influence. And he can't work his will in the earth without people. So Satan spends an enormous amount of time trying to persuade men to do things while at the same time convincing them all the time that it was their own idea and desire all along. <laughs> it's nuts. Now, haven't you noticed when Satan wants to condemn or uh, you know, bring accusations against you, where does he do that? Right here. It happens right here in the mind. The mind is the battlefield. And so when it comes to the church, we as believers, Satan wants to come. He wants to warp our thinking to get us off the mark to keep us from living that good life, to keep us from living out of peace, rivers of peace that God gives us. The mind is his target. Your mind, And you know what? You have to understand it's not just their mind. It's your mind he's after. He's after your mind, and he fights for your mind all day long, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So then how important is it for us to win these battles? It's huge because it affects everything in our lives and how we deal with our fellow man. Listen, every person that calls himself a follower of Jesus Christ has got this battle going on on the inside of them. Satan, he wants to shape our thinking and how we process things. He wants to do his will through us. Even though we know Jesus, he wants to work his will through us. Isn't that something? So then if that's the case, how do we win the fight? How do we do it? That's a good question. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to go over to a verse of Scripture in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. We looked at this last week. I want you to hear it. It says, don't be conformed. To the world. Don't be shaped after the pattern of this world, right? Don't believe every image and every stereotype you see in this world. It's a plant. It's been planted for you to change how you think, to get you off the mark, to screw you up. You understand? He says, but be transformed, changed. How? By the renewal of your mind. That by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and acceptable and perfect. This verse alone gives us some key insights that we need for our life and how we fight this battle that is in our mind. You see, the way that we fight this fight is by renewing our mind, by tearing down the old biases, the old ideologies, the old lies that's fed to us by Satan, by the world, and by everybody else, and all the myths and all the things that have been sown into our mind through the world, through the television, through the news media, social media, uh, possibly our parents, our teachers, our friends, and how they're influencing us. All these misunderstandings that we have about life, all the ignorance that our life has been built upon, we have to systematically tear down those structures and then rebuild brand new structures using the tools of truth. 
It's based upon righteousness and upon God's word. We have to tear down those old things and rebuild some new things. Look at the verse again. Do not be conformed to the world. Don't be fashioned after the world. Don't let the world mold you and how you think and how you see things. But be transformed by the renewal, the consistent and deliberate tearing down and rebuilding and renovation that needs to be done consistently of your mind. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You'll know the ways of the kingdom and how life really works. Amen? We've got to adopt God ways. And folks, this is particularly true about this subject of racism. It's a big deal. The Bible teaches us that we are to love every man, woman, and child on planet Earth. We're to see the unsurpassable worth in every human being. Because God so loves the world. Are you hearing me? And because of that, the Bible says we're no longer to know any man after the flesh. Because we're to see, as God sees, we're to tear down all those old ways that we used to think, the old ways that we used to see, the old ways that were indoctrinated in us. And we need to renovate ourselves with the truth and begin to see people as God sees them. Amen? When we see as God sees and realize his love is, is so powerful that it's for every man, it's life transforming. It is. And listen, when you see as God sees, how can any human being be a racist? How is it possible? When we see as God sees and the unsurpassable worth of all men and how much every man, woman, and child means to God, how could we be a racist? Or say racist things, or have racist remarks, or little backhanded comments, or little posts on Facebook. How could we when we see as God sees? When you see your fellow man as Jesus does, it's impossible to be a racist. You know, what does it matter what color someone's skin is? They're a human being. <laughs> What does someone's skin color mean anything? Didn't Martin Luther say we're to know men by the content of their character, not the color of their skin? To help us understand something about race, look at the Apostle Paul. I want you to see this. I want you to see how we as the church should see race. Okay? You know what? This is a revelation for a lot of people. They don't know this. But we need to know this. And this is, the, this is the Bible. This is the truth we're to renovate our minds with. So then, remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth. Now, Paul's talking about ethnicity here. He's talking about race. This is what he's dealing with. He's talking about culture here. He said at one time, that's who you were, right? So then, remember that at one time, that's the old man, you were Gentiles by birth. You weren't born Jews. You were born a Gentile. Every, a Gentile is someone who is not a Jew. Okay? So this is all about race here. Every bit of this. The whole book of Acts, think about it, is learning how to see and accept people who aren't like you. Think about all the trouble the church had at, in its beginnings because it was ran by all the Jewish people who were the only people, you know, they were God's children. Just think about how difficult it would be to abandon your race. In other words, just not to identify with your race when God himself came down from heaven and said, you are my special people. But they had to let go of that to embrace the world. I hope you're hearing me because this is, this is the fix to our problem. This is, the, this is what the nation needs to hear. This is what every pastor needs to hear. This is what you should be preaching in your pulpit. Not the talking points of the world. Don't be an echo chamber for the world. You need to be preaching the gospel because this is the only thing that's going to fix any of this mess. It says, remember that you were Gentiles by birth. You were called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision. The Jews had a physical circumcision made in the flesh by hands. He says, remember something. 
that you were once at that time without Christ, being alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in your world. But now, say but now. But now, things have changed. But now in Christ Jesus, who you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. He is our what? Jesus is our peace. I said Jesus is our peace. In his flesh, he has made in his flesh, by his flesh, he made both groups, Jew and Gentile. He changed them, right? He made them into one. And he broke down the dividing wall that is the hostility between the races. He broke it down. He tore it up. He destroyed it. He did. He abolished the law with its commandments that helped to build this wall in the first place. Right? That he might create. God's doing some creating here. Remember when he said, light be, and it was, traveling 186,000 miles per second, hadn't stopped? He's doing creating here. That he might create in himself one new humanity. One race of people. One new creation. In place of the two. Thus making peace. And might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross. Thus putting death to death at hostility through it. So he came to proclaim peace to you who were afar off and peace to those who were near. Everybody get some peace now. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then we are no longer strangers and aliens, but we're citizens with the saints, also members of the household of God. One household made up of many different people. We are one. You don't like that, you ain't in. You don't like that message, you're denying the gospel of Jesus Christ. Built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into this holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God Almighty. I like that. So again, God knows nothing about the white church. He knows nothing about a black church. God knows nothing about a brown church. God knows nothing about a yellow church. God knows nothing about a red church. God knows something about the one and only church. The church of the new creations. Those who have been born again. Amen. This is what Paul says along this this same vein. He says, so we in Romans 12. So we being many are one body in Christ. Notice this. Notice this. Okay, we're in Christ, one body. But we're individually members of what? One another. In other words, what he's saying is that we're all connected. We're all connected together. We're one. We're one race of people now. And so listen, I'm not talking, listen to me. Look at me. I am not talking about how the world views race. I don't give a flying crap how the world views race. I'm talking about how the church views race. All right? The world's talking points have been too long in our pulpits. They've been too long in our minds. They've been too long in our, in our, in our uh, thinking. And because of that, nothing but division. Our, our nation is being torn apart because of this crap. And people in the house of God still holding those views of the old man and wanting to raise those views up in the church. It's wrong. It's dead wrong. We are new creations. We're children of Almighty God. We're brothers and sisters. We're run one race of people. 
new creations. Amen? So I'm not talking about how the world views race. I'm talking about how the church is to view race. I'm talking about how we in the church are to see our brothers and sisters. We're, we're one. We're connected to one another. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 16. Therefore, from now on, since we got saved, remember, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation, old things pass away, and behold, all things become new, right? Well, he says right before that, he says, therefore, from now on, from this point of conversion forward, we regard no one according to the flesh. Nobody. It doesn't matter how you feel about it. Get over it. That's the truth. Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 10, For we, though many, are one bread and one body. For we all partake of that one bread. He's talking about identity here. He's saying you either identify with me or you're out. You either take on my identity, you abandon your own, your own thoughts, your own ideas, adopt all of mine, or you're not in. Simple as that. We've got to lose our life to live. Are you listening? So, though we're many, we're one bread, for we all partook of that one bread. I'm talking about Christ's new nature. And that's the very truth that we have to renovate our minds with. Our goal is to bring every man to Jesus Christ, to receive this peace in order to become brand new creations, these new, this new race of people on planet Earth. That is the cause of the church. And that is the cause the church is to gather around. It is. We're to love all men. We're to preach the gospel of peace and good news to everybody on planet Earth. So it's not our job to try to fix every injustice of this world. Why? Because it's impossible. Why? This world is evil. This world is corrupt. This world is ran by Satan himself. He is the God of this world. You understand that? He is the God of this world. You ain't going to fix it. The only person that can fix it is Jesus. That's why he went to the cross. And so our message has got to be the gospel. It's got to be the good news. We got to lift his name up. It's the only way we're going to get out of this, folks. This world is going to fall apart. And let me tell you right now, America, as it is right now, it's on its way out. If we don't, if change doesn't come, we're all in big trouble. Are you hearing me? We got to stop this stuff. Problem with America is ran by corrupt political systems and corrupt political parties on both ends of the aisle. And they both have sleazy agendas. And when the church jumps into the fray, you know what happens? It's just stained and labeled by that same corruption. And it hinders the voice of the church to reach mankind. It does. God told us to go out into the highways and the byways. To compel people. Come in. Before it's too late. Come in. You know, I know I'm going a little long. But I got to because I got to finish this. If anyone could have been political, it was Jesus Christ. Jesus came into a world where his nation, his people, were totally occupied by a foreign army. You don't think Jesus could have led an insurrection? He's God. If anyone could have been political, if anyone could have talked about the Jewish race, if anyone could have defended his people, it was Jesus. You know what Jesus did? He didn't do any of that. You know what he did? He stuck to the mission. He stuck to the plan. He brought liberty and freedom for all men. 
He said, come to my table and enjoy the goodness. Come and drink in peace. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and say amen to that, folks. Listen, the people of this world, they're walking in darkness. They're living in sin, and they're doing as they get good and ready to do. They do as they please. And many of them enjoy the darkness, and they don't want to come to the light. Are you listening? So joining their cause is not going to change people's minds about Jesus. Please, church, understand that. It's only going to label the church as a hater in the minds of this people group or that. It's just going to bring more division. Because it's all built on lies. And it's all built on lusts. And it's all built on people's agendas. Which are all being orchestrated by the devil himself. Don't team up with the world, it says. Don't team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? It is an impossibility. So you can't fix anyone until they're willing to come to the light and repent of their sins and ask God to rescue them. And you know what the Bible says? Unfortunately, there's only going to be few that find it. A remnant of people are going to be saved, unfortunately. The Bible says, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. But narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are few that be that find it. So you and I must renew and renovate our minds from the world and its system and its views and its political parties and all that crap that does nothing but bring destruction upon all of us. Because this world... And our nation is in for some real trouble if we don't. Our job is to take the light of Jesus to all men, not just to our brand of people. So the question is, as I close, is where are you going to stand? You see, you got to make a decision. You can't just say, okay, sera, sera, whatever's going to be is going to be. No, you got to take a stand. you got to choose a side. Where are you going to stand? You're going to stand in all that stuff that brings confusion and, and, and uh, uh, division and all the anger and all that stuff. You're going to get involved in all that. You're going to become a part of all that, are you? Is that where you want to live? Well, then peace will not be a part of your life because the Prince of Peace ain't there. Or are you going to be on the side of the kingdom of God and as a new creation go about telling people God so loves you and he's the answer to your problem he's your healer he's your guide he's he's the answer to the oppression that you're feeling if you think you're going to get the world to change their mind about oppressing you you're nuts they're just going to take it a whole take it up to a whole nother level all right you're 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 you're, the, the the rescue you're looking for is in Jesus And until we change the hearts and minds, nothing out here is going to change. And so the answer is to change the hearts and minds of people. I hope you're hearing me today. we got to stand with Jesus and declare God's love. And for that to happen as a follower of Christ, with the Spirit of God deep down on the inside of us, there has to be this consistent tearing down of the old thoughts and the old ways and building our lives upon the truth with the new ways of the kingdom of God. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. We need to, we need to question this stuff. We need to discard this trash, right? This world is shoveling all kinds of crap down our throat each and every day. Can't you see that? And it's trying to change your mind and get you all riled up so you become an enemy of people. It's stupid. Instead, fix your attention on God. And what will happen? You'll be changed from the inside out. So what do we need to do with our thoughts? We're to fix our thoughts on God. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. And notice this. Unlike the culture around you always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, which politics always does, God brings the best out of you and develops well-formed 
maturity in you. That's why right now we need to make a decision like never before. Because right now we have an entire nation of people acting like children. And we need the adults to step up in the room and proclaim the goodness of God and be proclaimers of peace and tell them we know the way come on yeah we understand you've been beaten down by the world we understand you've been treated terribly we understand those racist remarks we we know what that what, what you're dealing with we've seen it we've, we've experienced it. it's horrific but I'll tell you this is the answer it's found in Jesus you ain't never going to find it in the world man it's found in Jesus Christ it's found in the church. Come, be a part of us. Be a part of me, and I'll be a part of you. Somebody say amen in this house. That's the good news. That's the good news. And until you're ready to understand it, receive it, let go of your grievances, and step up to a higher plane of life, it's just going to pull you down. And you're going to act like a child. There's no need for that. We need adults in the house. Amen? Amen. I pray you heard what I said. If you're a pastor out there listening to this, proclaim this from your pulpit. We need the truth. Because there is way too much division out there. And it's dangerous. It's dangerous. It's endangering all of us. We've got to be careful. We've got to stay with the Bible and what God says. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for your people. I thank you. It's the truth that sets us free. It's the truth that brings freedom and liberty to all men. And I pray in the name of Jesus that you open up our hearts. Get rid of the hardness of our hearts all that had happened to us in the past that has made our hearts hard. Father, bring your healing because you said you are the answer to the oppressed. Bring your healing supernaturally. Let us find all that we need in you, Jesus. And Lord, help us, teach us, help us to renovate our minds, make us new from the inside out, God. If you don't know Jesus, say, Lord Jesus, Thank you for forgiving me of all my sins. Thank you for being the Lord and Savior of my life, dying for me so that I could live this brand new life. Today I come to you. I know that you died and you rose again just for me. So today I declare you as my Savior and my Lord. Bring peace to my life. Bring family and connectedness. Father, I thank you for receiving me. And God, I pray right now for our nation. I pray for healing. And I pray that your kids will begin speaking and spreading love and your message of truth showing the world the way so they can be rescued. God, help us point to the door. Help us point to Jesus through all that we say and all that we do. God, help us get rid of our political parties. Help us get rid of all that trash that's in our minds. Help us not to be political people, but to be people of honor and truth. Let the light shine out from us where people don't have to wonder where we stand. We stand for you, Jesus. We stand for you. We ask in Jesus' name that you anoint us, change us, minister life to us so we can take this life into the world. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, a sermon like this isn't easy to preach because there's so much opposition, so much. There's so much ignorance out there in the world. So much. We got to start speaking the truth. Amen.